There's still some people coming in, so I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes there, or a minute even. Hi, everybody. Just giving it a minute for everybody to get in there. You're all very welcome today. Yeah, I think we're getting near there. Still coming in. Okay, I'm going to get going now. So listen, I just want to say welcome everybody today. Good afternoon and you're very welcome to this webinar. We're, we're delighted that so many of you could make this session today during your lunch break. I hope you all have a cup of tea and a sandwich there and uh, you can relax and enjoy this webinar today. Um, we've lots of attendees from different backgrounds here today, from nursing background, carers background, etc. Um, I'd like to thank Family Carers Ireland, um, the Irish Association for Palliative Care as well, IAPC, Jacintha. Thank you very much for inviting your members to join us today as well. Um, I'd like to thank Nicole Forrester and Karen O'Connor who are supporting this webinar behind the scenes today doing all the tech work and everything's fantastic. Thank you both for that and welcome to Valerie Smith and Marie Cantwell here today our speakers. So just to let everybody know this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared afterwards and it will also be available on our website. Um, my name is Maurice Damery. I'm Programme Manager of the Dine Well at Home Programme in Healthcare in the Irish Hospice Foundation. So Irish Hospice Foundation are running this webinar today as one, one of our many activities to support Palliative Care Week, which many of you will know uh, is led out by the All-Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care. The theme this year is you, me and palliative care and the theme is chosen with the aim of reminding people about the different ways that palliative care can touch any of our lives, how it can affect all of us and how it can benefit us if and when we might need it. Palliative Care Week aims to raise awareness about what palliative care is and how it can be used to future plan needs while also supporting people with life limiting illnesses and those who are close to them. So you'll find more information on the All Ireland website and I know Nicole is going to share the link there to the hub that has all the information. Just to let any nurses know today that there will be um, continuing uh, education units that you can get when you get your certificate at the end of the day. There is a Q&A function which you can use if you have any questions and we, we'd be delighted if you put any questions in as the speakers are speaking today and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. I know the time is tight but we will do our best. There will also be a few polls with questions during the webinar and it would be great if you could be participate in this to inform our future work. So I'm going to introduce now our first speaker of the day, Valerie Smith. Um, Valerie's session is around advanced care planning and it involves everyone. So Valerie in her role as public engagement lead with the Irish Hospice Foundation leads on Think Ahead, the advanced care planning programme, including awareness raising, training and education, distribution of the Think Ahead planning pack. And she works closely with network partners, community groups and public bodies to be, bring best practices for advanced care planning to the forefront. So welcome Valerie and thanks very much for speaking today. Thanks so much, Maurice, and thanks so much for inviting me back. Uh, to present today. Oh, actually, I've missed on one thing. Um, so I will be presenting on advanced care planning and how it involves everyone. Um, and because we have a good bit to get through, I'm just going to dive right into it. So for today, I do hope that people at the end of this short session are able to better define advanced or future care planning, explain the different actions of advanced care planning, explain the importance uh, of community to advanced care planning, identify 
the importance of conversations to those. That will be key to today. Key resources and where to find them um, in Ireland and how to start a conversation. So just to launch off, what is advanced care planning? We will be using Think Ahead as a key piece. Um, I suppose I didn't introduce myself properly. Apologies. I'm the public engagement lead with Irish Hospice Foundation and I lead on Think Ahead, our advanced care planning program. So that's why we'll be using Think Ahead as that key piece today. And in essence, advanced planning or future care planning, I'll kind of go back and forth between the two, is thinking about, talking about and telling or recording your choices. It's also about values and preferences for your care at end of life. And just to point out that this is a continuous process. This isn't sort of a, a one time uh, process, but something that is ongoing. Um, and I'll just answer that poll there. So you may see some kind of polls pop up throughout this just to gather kind of where we're starting and where uh, where people are at the end of this conversation as well. So I like to summarize this as thinking about, talking about and telling others about your future uh, for care at, at your end of life. And I, I use the, I go back and forth between advance and future care planning. Advanced care planning is that kind of clinical term. It's what we use in the research and this and that, but out in the field, people understand the term future care planning a lot better, a lot easier than advanced. So I'll go back and forth, uh, making sure that the language is accessible to everybody there. When we think about future care planning, there's actually a lot of different things that that involves. Um, we often think of it as kind of the, you know, the paperwork, the documentation, and that's really important, especially for understanding the legal side of things. But at the foundation of future care planning are these conversations, conversations with family, with doctors or GPs, consultants, conversations about quality of life conversations and thinking about who you would name in some of these important roles. So conversations are really the foundation of advanced planning. And people are far more likely to engage in conversation than they are to complete those documents. Um, and so the more that we can support people at the beginning, the more likely we are to help being able to support people through you know, the whole process of, uh, of planning and getting things in place. And people often ask us, you know, who can do this? Um, and the the answer is anybody, anybody over the age of 18 who has capacity. I'm not going to go super in depth into capacity today. We do have it in recorded trainings on other other um, on our platforms. Um, but if you have capacity and you're over 18, you can start planning. Um, but there are key populations that would benefit more immediately or more directly from planning. And so if you find yourself in one of these um, positions, we'd say now's a great time to start. Uh, if you're in a caring or supporting role, great time to start advanced planning. If you're planning for your in retirement, a nice practical step you could take. People with a life limiting condition, uh, always important to include this uh, along with treatment and planning uh, for care as well. And then I always add in our rebels and our know-it-alls, people who know that they want something that would be different than maybe what family or other people would recommend. Um, and with a few caveats here, I. I always say on diagnosis or if there is a change in prognosis or if there is a recent bereavement, these are less key times to start the conversation. Those are much harder moments. Um, so as much as we can, we want to plan things ahead of time um, and then incorporating them as people are ready, either in there or following their bereavement, following a diagnosis, but not always right at the beginning. Um, and carers and supporters, I know a lot of people might be uh, thinking about this a, either in a workplace role or caring for a family member, a friend, community member. Um, and I would encourage you as well to take this on for yourself if you're asking somebody else to kind of think about it for, for themselves and use this as the opportunity to think ahead and to, to plan ahead of time. And this benefits everybody. Planning benefits everybody. So it benefits people who... Um, who are the, the patient, the person being cared for, that their values are met, that their preferences are met. It, it benefits the people immediately around them, that they're able to care for uh, the person as, as is in line with their values. There's less confusion about what somebody wants, less conflict. Um, bereavements are improved. Obviously, we're, there's grief. We can't avoid grief, but, um, but we can improve it. Um, and if people are left with less stress about what's happened to them than their, uh, or what's happened to their loved ones, then they are more likely to report a better bereavement. And it also supports medical professionals so that they're not left making those challenging or hard decisions. I'll use a few slides here from our friends in the North, Compassionate Communities in Northern Ireland. Um, 
who really point out the importance of community at end of life care. This is somebody, it might be a visual of somebody who's fairly healthy, um, or let me say fairly younger as well, that a person um, who's who's um, on uh, sort of middle-aged perhaps would have a lot of different people in their lives that they can turn to for support. Um, on the left-hand side there, you'll see uh, people who are more professional and they engage with those people as well, but they're engaging with a lot of people in their community setting. As people age, that community often tends to decrease, especially people who are in older age, um, might have had a lot of people in their families uh, uh, predecease them. They also might have had a lot of family move away. So some of those um, uh, stronger connections out in the community have decreased and the care is really more medicalized. But this really just highlights the importance, I think, of thinking about how we look after people. And we often think there's always somebody to have that kind of uh, conversation. There's always somebody else. And in reality, there might not be that many other people to have these important conversations or to engage in this. So it does take all of us, uh, whether we have a huge network, whether we have a smaller network, uh, to support these to support this planning and these really important conversations. There's another perception as well um, that all, that a person who's ill, a person who's aging, are spending a lot of time in medical settings. But the reality is that they're spending about 5% of their time in a medical setting and about 95% of their time in a community setting. And I include, like a nursing home is sometimes a medical setting, but it's usually a community setting as well. Um, and so the majority of people, whether they're in a large community with a lot of people around them to talk to, um, or whether they're isolated and then that 95% of time is spent with the telly, um, most of the time they're in their community. And so we need to also work on sort of looking away from that professional to have these conversations, although that's very important that we have them everywhere, but that we can all take up these conversations as well <clears throat> in our personal lives. So with future care planning, there's actions, there's plans, and there's resources available for you. Again, going back to just this, um, this uh, overview of the different actions of future care planning. Again, they're ongoing, they're interrelated to each other. Um, we see a couple of different documents and a lot of different conversations there. So in order to start, we'll start with what are those resources to start those conversations? And some of them are documents. Um, and I know we'll have in the chat links to some of these here, but the Think Ahead Planning Pack, which we're, you will learn about in just a moment here, um, has a lot of different ways to start conversations and interesting uh, pieces that a person might never have thought about before. The Decision Support Service likewise has templates and guides to things. Um, but I really include down here in the kind of in the middle, We've got Baz and Nancy's last orders as an example of using media to start a conversation. That's a great, um, a great resource. If you haven't seen that, it's heartwarming. It's sad. It brings up emotions, but it's a nice way to think, you know, start and say, well, that was interesting. That was kind of funny. That was interesting. What would you want for yourself? It makes me think about what I want for myself. Um, so you can use any type of media if there's something that's coming up in a TV show or something that's coming up in a movie or you hear something on the radio. You can always use those. And I really encourage you to use those as conversation starters. Uh, similarly, there are some great books if you want to learn a bit more. Catherine Mannix, Dr. Catherine Mannix has a couple of great books with the end in mind. She also has a book called Listen about conversations, these important conversations that give you a bit of insight into things you might think about or things that... Um, ways to kind of start a conversation with somebody else. We also have uh, the IHF YouTube page has lots of recordings of that really go into depth, for example, on Think Ahead. Um, if you're a family care, we have a, a training for that. If you're in a professional, a, a GP or another medical professional, we have trainings for that. So looking at the same topic, but in different ways, as well as a few short videos. And we'll show you an example of that here. So now just to cover very briefly some of the things that you can do, what advanced care planning is, when a person, again, won't go into this, but has capacity fairly well to, um, to understand uh, what they're able to decide, they can make things such as an advanced healthcare directive, an enduring power of attorney, and a last will and testament. I won't go over last will and testament, that's a conversation for another day. Um, but lacking capacity as a person begins to need a bit more help in making some of those more important decisions, there are still resources. So no matter where you, your family member, your friend, or your patients are, there is something there that can support a person to make decisions around medical choices um, and even financial and personal affairs. So uh, these 
uh, the all these uh, bottom half as well as the enduring power of attorney go through the decision support service, which is linked in the chat. And um, it really is up to the individual to name who they would like to support them. And it goes from sort of least uh, um, uh, least need of assistance from the decision making assistant to the most need at a decision making representative. And so there's tiered support as a person needs. So decision support service has a lot more uh, information on that and we're working with them um, along with other partners to make this information and this process more accessible and easier to navigate as well. I'll briefly discuss here, um, oh I'll go over think ahead first and then I'm going to come back and share a little bit more about advanced care planning as well or sorry enduring power of attorney. So I have a short video here and I think my sound should work so just give me a shout if it's not working. Give it a try. Thinking about, about illness and injury, that alone end of life, can be, can be stressful. stressful. Most, Most of us try to avoid thinking about it and simply carry on with our everyday lives. But not thinking about these things doesn't make them disappear. Just like talking about what might happen in the future, including the end of life, doesn't make it happen any sooner. Addressing the elephant in the room, however, can reduce stress and anxiety both for you and those close to you. With advanced care planning, you can ensure you receive the best care available when you need it most, and that your preferences and decisions are respected. The Think Ahead Planning Pack is a tool to guide these conversations with your loved ones and to record your choices. Each planning pack comes with three documents. In My Personal Wishes and Care Plan, you can record your preferences for care. For example, where you would like to be looked after. It includes information about your legal and financial paperwork and your funeral plans. These decisions are important to describe so others know how to look after you and don't have to make those decisions for you. In My Advance Healthcare Directive, you can record your healthcare decisions and name a representative to make healthcare decisions on your behalf in the future in case you are in a situation where you cannot make your decisions heard. The third document is My Medical Summary Form, which summarizes all your details so you can share them with your GP or consultant for your medical file. You should make and share copies of all the documents and place the originals in a safe and, ac and accessible place. With advanced care planning, you are taking your care into your own hands. Rest assured that your voice will be heard through all stages of your life. So we do have those documents available. Um, they're free to download and print yourself. You can order them through thinkahead.ie or hospicefoundation.ie or by ringing us and they're available by invoice and you'll have all that contact information at the end as well. Um, and so just to summarize, I think that video does it better than I could ever do it and uh, uh, in a more concise way. Um, but in essence, all of these documents are um, you know, in order to speak for you when you cannot speak for yourself. So they all, they come into effect when a person cannot make these plans or make these decisions for themselves. And so as much as possible, we really encourage people to do things um, while they while they're well enough and have capacity to make decisions. Within the planning pack, there's those three documents. They're customizable so that you can use them as your plan or they can teach you how to make your make and draft your own plan. We have the Think Ahead hub, thinkahead.ie, that has more resources, more insight into some of what your options are, just so you have a bit of information there. As I said, we had a load of online trainings as well on our YouTube page, which is linked here. Um, and we have this public awareness campaign. So we've been all over the country the last two years training community groups acute net, hospital settings, nursing homes, um, all sorts of places so that wherever people are interacting with this, they're able to learn a little bit more um, and everybody, somebody there is able to speak to them about this. Briefly on enduring power of attorney, the decision support service uh, runs the enduring power of attorney. And this is where an individual such as myself would be allowed to legally appoint a chosen attorney uh, to act on their behalf uh, for certain decisions in the future. And this really relates to financial 
property and personal affairs. Uh, this doesn't relate to medical conditions. That's the advanced health care directive. Um, and there is a bit of a process in going through this right now, but it's all done through the decision support service. It, it, it is more intensive than an advanced health care directive, as in it requires statements of, of, of having capacity from a solicitor and from a medical and professional. Um, and it's completed online, then registered, and then later when it when it comes into effect is only when it's needed. So it's enacted once it is needed down the line, um, if and when that is. So we are working, as I said, with the Decision Support Service and other community organizations to make this more accessible um, and, uh, uh, and make the process kind of easier to navigate. But that said, I will just say that, um, you know, it might, I have this as a professional experience, the knowledge around this, but I also has, have it as personal experience um, being appointed a, an attorney for someone in my family. And I highly, highly, highly recommend um, that these documents are completed because it really helps to uh, ease the strain and ensure that a person's voice is is maintained throughout their life. Of course, all of this comes back to how we start these conversations, and I think this is a really key piece of uh, foundational, as we saw earlier. So um, this is a, you know, there's a lot of information on here. Don't worry too much about this slide. This is just to kind of show how people make changes in their lives. You may already have used this um, in your role in terms of helping people quit smoking or adopt a healthy habit, like, uh, you know, eating more vegetables, whatever it might be. What we understand about how people change, and there's different theories, but I really really like this one, is that people don't go from never having heard of a concept before to making that change in that same exact day. So when we work in the community, somebody uh, somebody might come up to me and say that their child sent them along. They actually don't really want to be here, but they're going to learn about it anyway. Um, they've never thought about changing their behavior before. They've never thought about doing any advanced planning before. But after they leave our session, they're aware of it. They're aware of what they could do, why they might want to do it. They're not necessarily going to make any changes that day. But over time, as they think about it, they prepare, they gather the resources uh, that they might need. They talk to the people they might need to. And then eventually they'll take they'll start filling out documents, you know, or they might start having those conversations as, a, you know, those different actions all, all, all go through the same process. So they start having a conversation, they start filling out paperwork, they have to keep going. It takes some time and then life might happen. Uh, uh, a child could move away and um, there could be a death in the family. Something major could happen. A person could get a promotion and suddenly they're too busy to kind of keep working on this. All sorts of things might get in the way of keeping going with um, uh, with these actions. Um, but, but a person never goes back to not understanding them. They understand them now and it's all about kind of coming back in, linking them back up with the supports that they need to finish off the process. So I point this out because Oftentimes what we hear from maybe our acute settings is, OK, well, I've given them the information, but who's going to support them all the way through? And this is especially true for socially isolated people who might not have a family member around um, or a community group that they attend frequently to support them through this process. move through kind of all these processes. And, you know, why they make these changes as well is one, the knowledge. We're very good at supplying that, but we also need to be helping them understand or helping them understand why it's important to them to um, to go through this process, uh, identifying whether it's, you know, that they want to stay at home and that's really important to them. Um, uh, and so getting that written down, but uh, but it could be anything at all that that maybe looking after an adult child who needs some additional supports helping them to have the confidence to complete these documents or, or knowing where to turn uh, to have help to complete them and their own personal motivation. Uh, so what is it that's going to inspire you to complete them? And I always like to offer the example of creating an external motivator. Uh, you know, you complete these documents and you get to eat a whole a whole cake to yourself. That's one of my external motivators. Um, and so it's just helping people identify what is it that's going to help them through this process. The key to this, of course, is starting the conversation. It has to start somewhere. So I've got a few kind of key pointers here um, to starting how to talk. And this could be if you are starting to talk because you're the one who wants, oh, 
something's gone silent, I'm hearing, but I don't know why. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, Val, I can hear you. Um, yeah, I can hear okay. you, Val. Okay. Yeah, I can Seems hear like too. Okay, yeah, sorry, it seemed like I went lost. Else okay. Yeah, everybody's okay. coming back to say it's okay. There was a bit of a loss there for a second, Val. Don't okay. worry, but I think okay. you're back now. Thanks, Val. <laughs> okay, great. I don't I think it started happening just when I got to this slide. So um so the key is to talking, this is if you're looking to start a conversation um about yourself, or if you want to start a conversation and encourage someone to do these. I've given examples for both. But the the three basics for this when you're starting is firstly to set a clear time and place. Secondly, is to be really clear about what you want to talk about or that it's important. And the third is have have clear offers, um, offers that you're able to do for somebody or clear things that you need help with, ideally. So when you set a time and place, you know, I'd like to chat with you about how best to care for you. Can we have dinner and talk uh, for about an hour about this? And then you say, and then after that, we'll have a cup of tea and we'll go on our, you know, on our own ways. But setting a time and place, so not dropping this on somebody. Using clear language is really important um, um, and it could be depending on what a person needs. You know, I'm planning so that I have the best quality of life for as long as possible. That's really clear about what your priorities are for this. Or, you know, I want to talk to you about what might happen if you need more help, if you get sick or some, something suddenly happens. So you're really clearly stating what it is. And a person has the option to, to turn you down, but keep persisting, keep persisting. And then, of course, um, you know, asking for offering help. So if I'm offering help, I might say I can go with you to your GP appointment and take notes. That's a really clear offer of help. Um, or you could say, you know, I'm having trouble learning about how to make an EPA. Can you help an enduring power of attorney? Can you help me with that? Um, so having those kind of three things to get a conversation started is really easily is is is, you know, those are the three key pieces on the other side of things. If somebody wants to talk to you about their own wishes, there's a few keys to listening with these conversations as well. And the first one is to listen. The second one is to clarify. And the third one would be plan next steps. So similar to the others, but on the first side of things, whether or not it makes you uncomfortable to try and listen. I know this is uncomfortable, but I'm going to try. Uh, please let me know if I'm interrupting you. I can be great at that. And do you mind if I take notes? So um, oftentimes when we're going into these conversations, it can be overwhelming. So take notes as you go. You might not remember everything afterwards. If there's any sort of clarification that you need, they ask for that. You know, I heard you say, this is a real example from my own family. I heard you say that you don't want to be a vegetable. What does that mean to you? You know, so when somebody gives uh, is using euphemisms or is using phrases that might be understood, um, but to clarify what some of those terms are, you know, I heard that you say you might want to you want to stay at home. That's the most important thing. Am I hearing that right? Is that right? So just to clarify as you go and make sure that you're understanding what they're saying. Or sorry, I like this one, too, because this is another example for my family, a uh, different person who said, uh, you know, I want every treatment they have. He told me and I said, OK, well, is there anything you don't want? And um, so just to clarify, where does that where does that um, start and end? Um, and then planning next steps. So it's easy as saying, what would you like to do next? Or um, have you talked to anyone else about this? Or would you like me to help you talk to other people? And I think it's really important. I'm going to uh, really important to recognize when you need a break from these conversations too. I need a break, but can we talk about this next week? Take a break, but come back to it. Come back to it and don't, don't let it linger. Um, Again, just coming back to this, allow yourself to move slow with these conversations or allow the person that you're hoping to talk to to move slow with these conversations too, because it is a lot to consider and think about. People don't know what their options are right away. Um, people have to think about the, you know, the politics of, of family or um, certainly, you know, if they don't have somebody to name in, in some of these roles, what then matters the most to them? So it is intensive. And so just take your time in moving through these move through them, come back to them. And it's all about coming back to the process. For those of you who are in organizations, um, I just, I recommend or organizations or in healthcare settings, um, a few options for next steps as you begin to introduce the idea to service users. You can use that stages of change model. We do have some additional resources. I'll have my contact information on the next, um, on the next slide um, to kind of help with that. Um, involving family and caregivers and supports as much as possible. I really recommend somebody understanding how to um, 
uh, navigate the decision support service on site as much as possible because it is a tricky service to navigate for some people and hosting support groups or places where people can come together to complete their documents. A few, you know, next steps and we're looking um, in Irish Hospice Foundation at ways that we can support those processes as well, especially with the Think Ahead program. Um, so do reach out with questions and um, with additional re needs for resources. We have leaflets, which are a great way to get people started. Uh, we have the packs, we have posters, um, and uh, and if there's specific things you need, we may be able to help as much as possible. We do online trainings as well on Think Ahead. That would be more specific into that. So Think Ahead at Hospice Foundation, there's our contact information, um, and do reach out with any anything that comes up. So thank you for the time. I know we've rushed through loads, but I hope that you got a little bit out of that. Thanks, Val. That was great. And uh, sorry, everybody, for the gremlins and the glitches there with the technology. It must be something in the atmosphere out there today. Um, I think it's the weather, probably. Um, Val, that was really good and really insightful and lots of great tips about when to start and have those conversations. And I think that piece about, you know, advanced care planning helps everybody. It helps the person, but it also helps everybody who's around them. Um, Nicole or Karen, I'm not sure, were there any questions that came in? They're gone quiet yes. in the background. <laughs> um, we didn't have any questions come in there um, at that time. Okay. No. Okay, that's great. Well, then we can continue on then, Val, with our next speaker. Um, thanks very much, Nicole and Karen. And thanks again, Val. That was a fantastic presentation. Brilliant to have you today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great. So our next speaker today um, is Marie Cantwell. And Marie Cantwell is going to speak to palliative care across community settings. Marie is the Professional Development Coordinator for General Practice Nurses in Dublin North. She is a registered nurse who has practiced in acute care, rehabilitation, occupational health and for many years as a GP nurse and registered prescriber. Are you there Marie as well? You are? I certainly am, Marie. Brilliant, Hiya. that's great, that's fantastic. Um, Marie, Marie joined the HSE in 2020 and in her role she provides support to GPNs in all aspects of practice development from foundation to advanced practice level, as well as contributing to educational programmes and curriculum development and the facilitation of training and development initiatives to strengthen the expertise and evidence based of practice nursing within general practice. The Professional Development Coordinator's um, role for GP nursing at local, national and international level collaborate with all, all key stakeholders to further a quality driven nursing service across primary care in line with national health strategy. Marie is currently pursuing a master's uh, degree in research at DCU with the focus on GP nursing's contribution to primary care. Marie, delighted to have you here today and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maurice. I hope you can hear me OK. Yeah, perfectly. Um, Thank you. Thanks to the gremlins from my side of things. Nicole is going to um, manage my slides for me. Thanks in advance, Nicole. I'll try not to um, hassle you too much. Um, first of all, I suppose, is to say hello, everybody, and thanks, Maurice, for that introduction, and thanks to everybody from the Hospice Foundation for inviting me to contribute to today's webinar. Um, when I came into my current role after many years as a GP nurse, it became a part of my job to represent GP nursing on various boards boards and committees and I've been really lucky that one of the areas I've been drafted onto was the area of palliative care both as a member of the primary palliative care committee and as a member of the working group tasked with producing the new e-learning module on palliative care needs assessment which I'll mention again later. Um, as Maurice said I work in practice development supporting nurses working in general practice so you can see that my perspective today is very much a community nursing viewpoint and i'm hoping to paint a picture of how palliative care applies across community settings even if we don't realize it so i'm not a palliative care expert i'm not a specialist and i don't really have much even clinical experience in traditional palliative care settings like hospice care um, I have, of course, like most of us, I'd imagine, have some experiences, both personal and professional, of life living, limiting conditions, of palliative care, of planning ahead and of dying well at home. 
but it's only now with my experience working with the Irish Hospice Foundation and with the National Clinical Programme over the last couple of years that I can see how I've both benefited from and applied palliative care in various guises throughout my life and throughout my career. And that's really where I'm coming from today. My perspective is what I hope to get across is that palliative care is not just end of life care provided by specialist services, but rather that it's an approach to patient care that is to some extent within the skill set of all of us and within the requirements for any carrier to, carer to provide in potentially any setting. Um, next slide, please, Nicole. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is to just very quickly um, talk a little bit about taking a palliative care approach to practice in community settings. What do we mean by palliative care approach? Who needs it? who provides it and where, and how can we do it really well to support those patients in the community who would benefit from it. Um, just a note here, you will note that I use the term patient, and this is the most common term used in general practice. So I accept, of course, that it's not always used and obviously note the inclusion of all, whatever term you use, be it client, service user, resident, or any other. Um, next slide, please, Nicole. So Evelyn Wakefield, was a 33-year-old mother of two when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. When her cancer had spread and her pain and her mobility issues had gotten to the extent where it was affecting her quality of life, her oncology team suggested getting the palliative care team involved. At this, Evelyn describes how she and her husband burst into tears because they saw it as the end. She said that she felt if she brought the palliative care nurse into her life that she was really dying and that her friends used to shiver at the thoughts of the palliative care nurse coming to her home. So Evelyn noted that the perception was out there that palliative care means ends of life, but thankfully she realized after a while it doesn't. And she acknowledged it as giving her the best quality of life for as long as could possibly be managed. So if it's not just end of life care, what is it? So I did a little straw poll among colleagues in the office and this word cloud on the left was the result. You can see that perspective is closely focused on death and pain and cancer. And then if you take the WHO definition, um, which hopefully Nicole will pop up there for me, thank you, you can see that this perspective opens up. There's no mention dying here, and there's a myriad of similar definitions out there. The next word, Clyde, is what I suppose I tried to put across as my interpretation of the palliative care approach to care. Simply putting steps in place to meet the needs and wishes of the patient to improve quality of life. Next slide, please, Nicole. So this is taken directly from the Hospice Foundation Palliative Care Booklet, and it states that palliative care is holistic care that includes looking after physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual well-being, aiming to support the patient and to maintain quality of life when diagnosed with their li living with a limit life-limiting illness. So there are a few things here that I think that are worth honing in on. Holistic care the application of the four domains of palliative care, physical, psychological, emotion, and spiritual. And I'll come back to that again. The booklet goes on to note that it, palliative care also supports family and significant others, facilitates open and honest communication, provides symptom control, and improves your ability to participate in daily activities and hobbies, um, what Evelyn Wakefield called the gift of a good day. Um, the word support, the phrase quality of life, and that timeline when diagnosed or living with a life limiting illness. Palliative care is supportive care offered throughout the progression of a life limiting illness or at any phase therein. And I think they're really important aspects just to hone in on a little bit. Um, next slide, please, Nicole. So the focus here is that care is entirely person-centered. And I think it's really important that we remember this throughout. What's quality of life to you? What's the limitation on my life might be a standard for another. What is important to a patient is the most important thing. And to my mind, the cornerstone of the palliative care approach. So if the aim of palliative care is to give you life in your years, not necessarily add years to your life, how does this apply to us all in community care settings? And I think a really good place to start is to think about who are the patients that might benefit from a palliative care approach to practice. So 
who is the palliative care patient? Palliative care is required for a huge range of diseases. Our first thoughts, I know, go to the patient suffering from cancer with a natural focus that we might make on symptom management, such as pain and difficulty breathing. But what about the other many groups of patients with life-limiting or life-threatening diseases? The cardiovascular disease, the chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, kidney failure, chronic liver disease, MS, Parkinson's, rheumatoid arthritis, neurological disease, I could go on and on, and not forgetting um, frailty and dementia. So what is really important is the offering and the application of the palliative care approach throughout the duration of all of these illnesses from diagnosis and through all stages to death. I'd love you now maybe just to take a minute and think of a patient you know who has a diagnosis of a condition that is considered to be life-limiting or life-threatening. Think of your newly diagnosed heart failure patient maybe, a patient who has come to the end of therapeutic treatment for a chronic condition or that elderly patient with advancing frailty. Maybe keep that patient in mind a little bit as we go on from here. So next slide, please, Nicole. So we know that there are a couple of hundred of you registered on here to watch the webinar. I don't have a full list, but I can imagine we have nurses, we have other allied health professionals, perhaps doctors, carers, and many more. And there's probably as many again of locations in which we all work. And when I was trying to describe it, I was thinking that we provide care wherever our patient currently resides. Um, I was reluctant to say where the patient calls home because I think we care for many patients who don't consider their current residence as home at all. So what I came up with was that all of these patients that we talk about are somewhere in our community, whether they're in our nursing homes or their own homes, in temporary homes or in cosy cottages. So if you reflect back on the previous slide and the large variety of patients with life limiting conditions, you'll see that those patients are everywhere and definitely everywhere we as health carers work. Next slide, please, Nicole. So if these patients are everywhere and palliative care approaches can be applied to care settings everywhere, the next question is, who are we that are likely to provide it? So a little bit of formality here, palliative care is carried out at three different levels. So level one is any healthcare professional who applies a palliative care approach to any individual with a life-limiting condition. So who's that? It could be you, the GP nurse with the large caseload of chronic disease management patients, some of whom are limited on quality and extent of life from, for example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or heart failure. It could be you, the public health nurse, visiting the patient with progressive frailty who has fallen at home. Or it could be you, the GP, attending the nursing home to see the patient with advancing dementia. Level two palliative care can also be provided by a large range of health and social care professionals, but it has an additional educational or experiential piece. So this is the GP or the GP nurse who has done the search in palliative care, or the public health nurse or the social worker who has a postgrad focused on palliative care and puts those principles into practice with their patients. They use their training and they use their experience as part of their normal practice. And level three then is specialist palliative care, practiced by trained specialist staff who work in this area full time. They're called upon when the complexities of illness need their expertise. So again, important to point out, not always end of life. There are also referral pathways for symptom control in patients who might need an interim intervention to manage symptoms. So requiring referral to specialist palliative care in the short or medium term, for example, for pain control or to support improving breathing or mobility. Again to improve quality of life. A person can be in and out of palliative care and may of course require specialist palliative care at end of life also. Next slide please, Nicole. So when researching how to put a structure on today's talk, I was looking up terms and definitions, palliative care, what is it? And there's obviously loads and loads of stuff there, but I wanted to try to pin down what is termed the palliative care approach. 
the key components of palliative care in everyday practice, I tried to put a spin on it that would make sense for community and how we apply a palliative care approach to the patients with life limiting illnesses for whom this kind of care might have benefits. So I tried to pull together in my own words what I consider the important aspects of a palliative care approach. Next slide, please, Nicole. And that to me is the fact that palliative care is holistic care. It's the physical, the psychological, the social, the emotional and the spiritual care of the patient and the family or the support system of that patient. So think of that patient that you identified earlier. He or she is with you one day when they hint that they're scared to die. Do you say, don't be daft, you have years in you yet. And yeah, healthcare is busy and you have three patients outside the door waiting for you and it's already three o'clock and you should be gone home since two. So can you ask that question that you know is going to delay you another half hour? Do you open that door? And what is it in particular that you, know, that you ask the patient? Do you say to them, so what especially is making you afraid? Or do you extend the matter? Do you say, look, we're really pushed for time today and I'm sorry because I would really like to spend some time exploring this with you. Can we make a further appointment for another time when we can talk at more ease? Or if it's outside your comfort zone or maybe outside your scope or your skill set, can you say something like, can I ask the nurse or doctor to speak with you about this as I think it's really important and I think we want to help. For me, one of the most important things I've learned about palliative care and about this approach is the need to help patients to identify what is the most important thing to them and to support them to achieve it. Um, a little story for you now. So Bridget is 89. She lives alone. She has advanced COPD and many issues. She's been visited by the public health nurse. Um, the GP asked for a home visit to look at her nutritional status and to look at how things are at home because of concern. And reluctantly, Bridget allowed the public health nurse to come and see her. And there, our PHN found a very proud, very lonely lady living in quite squalid conditions with a really strong cigarette smell in the house. She, was, she appeared to be extremely undernourished and the PHN watched Bridget struggle for breath as she tried to open the back door to let her little dog out. When the public health nurse had a look around, she found multiple canisters of unopened oxygen in a side room and a very disorganized pile of medications on the kitchen table. So we have an elderly lady living at home with no help poorly managing significant polypharmacy, ashamed of her unkempt house and facing into the end of her life alone. Now that public health nurse didn't have a palliative care background or a qualification, but what she did have was the compassion to help to ascertain what was the most important thing to Bridget. Have you any idea what that might have been? It was actually two things. So our PHN discerned quite easily that Bridget had two loves in life, cigarettes and her dog. And she wasn't using her prescribed oxygen because she was afraid with her cigarettes that she would start a fire and her dog might be hurt. So yes, loneliness was identified as a huge problem, shame at the condition of her once perfect house and a reluctance to allow anyone in to help because of the smoking and the oxygen. Now, the PHN's simple approach would be to lecture Bridget on the dangers of smoking, tell her to give it up, berate her for her lack of oxygen use, um, I suppose an attempt to control or to fix the situation. And the obvious help was the medication reviews, pharmacy blister packing, home care package, meals on wheels. But our PHN, with her palliative care approach, identified the most important things to Bridget, the dog and the fags. She needed a safe place to smoke with careful instructions, better storage and safety of her oxygen canisters, and a real focus on the fact with, by using her portable oxygen, she could even go out into the back garden with her little dog for a short period of time. It was the focus on her life, not denying death, but creating a space for her to optimize the quality of her life and to plan ahead when she was ready. And yeah, the simple fixes were in there as well. They were easy to put and they did result in a much less lonely and higher quality final months of Bridget's life. So 
Um, Nicole, if you could just click there, I've put up the word opportunity and it might seem like a really strange word to use, but in recent months, I've learned more about palliative care and I think I've used some very strange phrases over and over again, but I've learned to concentrate on our role in the community and how it provides us with opportunities to use this approach in our settings, to support our patients, to maximize their quality of life, to be as independent as possible and to identify what's most important to them. So back again to your patient, can we take this approach to identify what's most important, to support our patient to achieve optimal quality of life and to plan for what's ahead? And can we signpost the patient to the help that's there for them? Um, next slide, please. I don't really have to go into this in a huge way because Valerie's just outlined the whole planning ahead piece in such detail. Um, I will say that all my years in general practice, I never once broached such an idea with the patient. Um, in my personal life, yes, I brought my parents out for dinner and over an Irish coffee asked for instructions on their wishings, wishes in case one of them would die without time to prepare. Um, they were very well at the time and it was a source of great hilarity. Um, but it became huge value when it came to time to make arrangements. Um, and I'll be honest and say that I've begun and I have tipped away at my own planning ahead pack. It sits in a box in the study. I don't look at it too often. I plan on being around to annoy people for a very long time, but it's there. And I see it as a really important piece for us to leave a legacy of ease and comfort and help for those left behind once we are gone. Um, I think in practice, and obviously I can only speak for general practice, I think any of us working closely with patients, we all have an opportunity to normalize conversation around death and dying. We can give our patients a safe space to talk and to think about their futures. And this is a fabulous resort. I feel like this is a little bit of a gift, which we as healthcare professionals could all provide when we see it's appropriate in practice. And finally, um, Next slide, please, Nicole, just to touch, I suppose, on end of life care. So even though my focus has been um, that we're it's not all about end of life and um, we have to recognize end of life care, obviously, as an important part of palliative care um, end of life, according to, again to the Irish Hospice Foundation, offers treatment and support for people who are near the end of their lives to ensure comfort and dignity. Um, I thought I'd put up the purple symbol as I just love it. It's the symbol for end of life care. Um, it's inspired by ancient Irish history. Um, it's not associated with religion or denomination. It's three white interlinking spirals that um, reflect um, the cycle of life, birth, life and death. Um, the white outer circle then is continuity and the purple is nobility, solemnity and spirituality. I think it's a beautiful um, just depiction of end of life care. And I think for us, um, in the areas that we work in, whether you're involved in end of life care or not, where a patient, whether a patient chooses to spend their last months, their last weeks, their last days, their last hours in a hospice or at home, surrounded by family or friends or surrounded by healthcare workers such as us, there is a real need for us to be open and communicative about death, about its practicalities, as well as addressing the spiritual aspects about the fears and the hopes and the wishes of the patient, most importantly. So think back to the patient that you had in mind earlier. As that condition advances, will you speak openly and freely if they hint that they're worried about death? Will you know where to find information on the options available? Will you know how to get the patient that information and support? And will you consider that you've taken a palliative approach to the patient's care throughout? So where do we go? Sorry, Nicole, left. next slide. Finally, I'm almost there. Where do we go to learn more, to find the information or to study further or to upscale or to increase our knowledge in the area? Um, of course, I'm sending you to the internet. Where else did I send you? And to the websites of the Irish Hospice Foundation and the All-Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care. Both of these sites contain so much information for you. Support, information sources for your patient, for yourself. There's training courses. There's more coming. There are links to everything you could possibly want to know. So whether it's home care or night nursing services, a think ahead pack or bereavement services, it's all there. Um, for those of you in general practice, the ICGP run a certificate course in palliative care 
Last year, that course had 11 GP nurses on it who were supported by the Irish Hospice Foundation and the HSE. That course is currently being re redesigned and we hope will be open to GP nurses again going forward. So keep an eye on the website or give me a contact if you're interested in anything like that. And almost last slide, Nicole, I can't go without mentioning the new e-learning module on HSE land, which launches next Thursday. I mentioned I was part of a group that was putting um, working on this, I, my very small part of it and how lucky I was. But the PCNA is a tool which has been developed to support professionals to assess the palliative care needs of patients with life limiting conditions. So the idea is to identify current needs and to put care plans in place to meet them. It's a new year learning program. It's just gone up on HSC land. It's been officially launched on next Thursday at lunchtime. And Nicole, I know, is going to pop in the link for that webinar, which is at 12 o'clock on Thursday, which will officially launch the new one hour program being hosted on HSC land. It's aimed at all health and social care professionals, including those who provide level one and level two palliative care. So those of us who are not engaged full time in palliative care at all, um, those who have no experience, those who have some experience, those who have a little bit of experience, it's it's a, it's for everybody. Um, Thursday's webinar is going to outline it. It's going to talk about how it should be used, how it can support and how it can enhance the care provided to people with life limiting conditions. I'm really proud to have been a small part of it and I hope that it'll be really informative and useful to everybody in practice. And at that, um, thank you. Um, final slide, Nicole. Um, thanks to, again to everybody for inviting me along today. Thanks to Maurice for having me. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. That was great. Really uh, great presentation. I think the one thing that stuck with me there was life in your years, not years in your life. I think that's it's really good. And lots of people probably here have heard that before. I hadn't really heard of it said like that, and it's said beautifully. Um, and then the role of um, taking that opportunity in community practice, I think that's really huge. And I wonder if you think that is happening more now that people are becoming more, just more familiar with the concept that palliative care is not just end of life care. And, you know, what do you think about that in, in practice nursing and GP practice and from a public health nurse perspective too? I think it's twofold, mm -hmm. Marise. I think we're becoming much better at it. And I think we as a as a population, as a culture, are becoming much better at it. It's becoming much more acceptable to speak mm -hmm. about death and dying in general across the country. Um, but I also think there's an aspect there where we carry out this care all day long, every day. We maybe just don't put a name on it and we don't even yeah. realize we're taking a palliative approach. But a palliative approach is a, is a holistic approach. And certainly from a nursing point of view, a nursing model is a holistic model of care. Therefore, we're actively doing this care all the time. We just don't necessarily put a name on it. What I love about the palliative care, sort of putting the structure on it and even around the palliative care needs assessment piece is it gives it that formality. It gives it that kind of robust, I do this well because I have learned X, Y and Z or because I have these skills. So I think it's it can it can only get better and it will continue to get better. But I definitely think there is there's a surge towards that towards that kind of um, approval of those conversations and yeah. a, maybe a more compassionate approach to how we talk to people. That's great. No, I agree. I think it is it's something we're doing, but probably it hasn't been named as such and people don't recognize it. Um, I think it's great to see the palliative care and needs assessment tool coming out this Thursday. What time is that webinar again? And we can share the link. Is it too late to share that link? I wonder, no, um, I but we can share it so. afterwards. And yeah, Nicole has it and she'll put it up. Um, it's it's oh, still yeah. there for registration. Yeah, it's um, I think it's it's going to be just the launch, but it is going to explain to everybody what the tool is and how simple it is to use. It's not complicated. Fantastic. So go into the chat function there if, if Nicole has time. And there was just a couple of questions there, I think, for Val. I don't know, Val, if you're still there in the background. Um, just there was one or two if you are. I am indeed. Fantastic. And um, one that came into the chat function there was, is the Think Ahead Pack legally binding? Um, so the Think Ahead Pack is has three different documents. The Advanced Healthcare Directive, when it's properly signed and witnessed, would be legally binding uh, if it needs to come into effect. The 
personal wishes and care plan. That's a non-legally binding. That's really informational and place for a person to put down their wishes and preference. And that's why we separated out those pieces so that um, people would know which part is the legal part and which part is uh, not legal. Okay, great. Thanks for that. I hope that answers uh, the question there. And then another question that came in here was, my mum has dementia, but my siblings and I are next of kin. Do we have any rights? That's a great one. We do go into this more in some of our other trainings. Um, so in a in the uh, it's a tricky one. In best case scenario, um, your team would the medical team looking after your mom would be consulting with you about what um you think she wants and what you know based on what she wants and would be following that advice. Um, but the there is no legal hierarchy for next of kin. So, for example, you say you and your siblings. And so there might be if there's any sort of um, conflict in terms of what kind of care uh, your mom should get or what kind of care she would want. Um, there is no way of deciding who amongst you would have the next of kin status, if that makes sense. Um, and so because of things like this, we really recommend in as much as possible to put into place ahead of time those um, kind of decisions, healthcare, naming somebody as a healthcare decision maker. Um, depending on where your mom is with her uh, dementia and if she's able to make some decisions and, and she just needs a bit of assistance, there, there may be a process where you could use one of those other decision support um, agreements through the decision support service. That's sort of a longer training, but they might have a bit of guidance for you there. Um, so what I would say is you can use the you wouldn't while you can't make an advanced healthcare directive on behalf of your mom, you could use it to kind of guide the discussions with you and your siblings so that you understand um, and kind of bring you to a place where you can advocate for her what you think she would want better, um, but you don't have the legal rights. And so it can kind of go either way, just depending on who you end up working with in the healthcare setting. I don't know, Marie, if you would have anything to kind of add to that. I think it's it's a, it's a terrible area to have to navigate. And I really feel for anyone who has to go through that, um, that process, it's really difficult. And I suppose it, it unfortunately brings up that importance of planning before we become unwell mm -hmm. or before, you know, of really thinking ahead and of really planning, which doesn't help this person, unfortunately, I would say talk to your healthcare professionals, talk to the talk to the GP, um, see if you can get guidance or help in any area. And, you know, people will be willing to guide. And even though there might be legal basis of it, maybe you can come to agreements yourselves and go the softly, softly approach sometimes works. And I know there's uh, some great videos, I think, and there's lots of information um, on the website, Val, and Think Ahead, um, the Think Ahead Hub, Think Ahead mm -hmm. IE. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bit more there. And we are, we understand. Yeah. And like Maria was saying there, you know, it's, it is, it's a really tricky area. And so um, if you can put something in place, either, either through another decision support way that, that just gives, um, that gives your mom a bit of voice for longer. So there are resources out there. Um, it's not a perfect system, but it's getting there. Um, thanks for that, Val, and thanks, Marie. Um, I think we're kind of coming to near the end of the session, unless Nicole and Karen, there's any more questions that I may have missed coming through. We, we were getting a lot of questions about right. the uh, availability of the recording of this recording and of the slides. And so we'll have that on our website and we can, if it's OK, send out the slides with the certs mm -hmm. uh, if that works. That's great. And we'll just launch the last poll. OK, and there's something that's come into the chat function here. Uh, hi, I work in palliative care, stroke rehab ward in Dundalk. Currently, our beds have been taken over by infection control and introducing patients with CPEV or E, et cetera. I have concerns that we will not be able to support our palliative care end of life patients as we had done previously, as we are not being resourced any better. There was no consultation, not even uh, consultation, not even consultants were informed what arguments can I use to to help hold on to the service. I feel it's very vital to provide in our community. 
Um, it sounds like a very, very difficult situation and it's hard to, to answer that. And I suppose, you know, it's how, I don't know if Maria, you'd like to come in on that as well. It's, it's, it's very tricky. It sounds like a very political issue. And yeah. it, it's like it's like everything. We those of us on the ground working with the patients directly are the ones that are taking the hit and feeling guilty and you know um, and worried for our patients. Um, I'm not sure if there's any argument that can really be um, really be put forward there. Unfortunately, a lot of these decisions are made at a higher pay grade than those of us that are on the ground. Um, keep talking. Yeah, that's um, about it. Thanks, Maria. And is there anything else there, Nicole or Karen, that's come in? And thanks, everybody, for attending today. I hope you found the sessions beneficial and helpful to your, your practice as well. I think they've been very insightful today. And lovely, Marie, to hear from you from a community perspective, I think. And, you know, really putting both speakers together as well. You can see how Think Ahead, you know, in GP practice, there's great opportunities for practice nurses. I think very much in the community, there's, there's definitely areas that, that Think Ahead can be used and it can be downloaded as well um, on the website. So I think that's really important uh, that people can download it free. Um, if there's no other questions, Nicole or Karen, there, um, we might just close the session and everybody will be able to get a good lunch, I think. Anything, Nicole or Karen? Uh, nope. nope, that's okay. it. OK, well, look, thank you, everybody, and thank you for attending today's session. Um, I hope you get some time out to have some lunch. And there's lots of links there in the chat function where you'll find out some more information about Think Ahead um, and the links that Marie has put in about training and education. So um, I think the National Adult Palliative Care Policy, uh, just to let everybody know, is due to be launched this afternoon. So we'll all have to watch that space now in the next uh, 24 hours and see what's coming out of that. Um, meanwhile, have a good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, Maurice. Thanks, everybody, Thanks for listening. So Have a great day, everyone. Nicole, if you want to close off the session. Okay, I think we can leave as well. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.